So here we are at Holy Week. It's a time of, of certain traditions, right? And uh, there's different traditions that we have today. One of the traditions is palm branches, waving them around. Uh, Monday, Thursday, on uh, the evening we celebrate communion. That's a tradition. And on Good Friday, we gather at the foot of the cross. And one of the things we do is we sing some songs that have been around for a while. Some newer songs, some older songs. Uh, the Old Rugged Cross is one of those traditions of a song we love to sing. Sometimes people on Good Friday have hot cross buns. That's maybe a part of their tradition. Maybe there's a family gathering of some sort. On Easter morning, we celebrate and we have the traditional greeting, He is risen, He is risen indeed. And I guess as I say before that, uh, in the morning, uh, some households, many households, ours certainly does, has an Easter egg hunt of some sort, which is kind of a part of the tradition. And then kids come to church like just buzzing in the morning right? with on this crazy sugar high. Uh, God, please help Sunday school teachers on Easter morning. It's always a challenge with all those, those kids, right? And so generally speaking, we like traditions. Uh, we have traditions collectively that we celebrate and acknowledge. And at the same time, there are traditions that we might have personally, which have come to mean a lot to us. Um, but what I wanted to do this morning is to think about the difference between two words, tradition and traditionalism. Okay, tradition and traditionalism. One is life-giving and one is life-taking. One's life-giving and one is life-taking. So what do we mean by tradition? So uh, sometimes it can be helpful to go into what is called an etymological dictionary, which is like uh, a dictionary about the origin of words. Where did words come from, from what language, and then into the English language? And when you look at the word tradition, it traces back to traditio, meaning passing down or handing down something, right? And it's usually to do with a, a teaching of some sort, something that's important to us, some sort of teaching, and then we kind of create customs or events which support that teaching, so it's this passing down. And so sometimes we'll also talk about priorities, and so priorities are important, right? We want to keep God first in all things. And so what we've often talked about, it's, this isn't for me, it's from someone else, but you know, we want to keep the main thing the main thing. There's so many distractions, so much craziness in life. We want to keep the main thing the main thing. So as it relates to traditions, what a healthy tradition is, is it's something that helps us keep the main thing the main thing through time with customs and events. It's, and this is related to the teachings of Scripture. So, okay, it's keeping the main thing the main thing through time, through customs and events. There's a theologian named Yaroslav Pelikan who says it very compellingly like this. He says, next slide, Tradition is the living faith of the dead. Traditionalism is the dead faith of the living. Traditioning is the living faith of the dead. Traditionalism is the dead faith of the living. Okay, now what does he mean by that? Well, okay, the living faith of the dead. Okay, so living faith is good. It's alive. This is the faith that trances, traces back to our people in Scripture through Christ, the teachings of the apostles, through time, our spiritual ancestors, our forefathers and our foremothers that's come down based on Scripture to us, right? Dead people but a faith that is very much alive, which has been, as we said, passed down from one generation to the next. That's a good thing. That's, that's a very positive understanding of tradition. Traditionalism, not so good. It's the dead faith of the living. In other words, people who happen to be alive, they're going through the motions, and they're ticking some sort of religious box, but they don't actually believe what these teachings say. It's not alive in them. Oh, some other person maybe believed that, but I'm going to go through the motions and take some sort of box. And that, my friends, is dead. And so we're going to talk about this a little bit today as we go through the text. Now, why is this particularly poignant for us today? Because tradition, when it's understood in a biblical and healthy way, is a very stabilizing, powerful, important, good rooted thing in our lives. But so many people and more and more people are feeling particularly untethered. Untethered. We live in this time where there's lack of clarity or lack of stability or in structure in so many people's lives. I think this is something that's going on in a wide-scale cultural way. Now, why is that? Well, Partly it could be because of the pandemic, right? We're coming out of it, but a lot of people have had their lives disrupted and disturbed, and maybe there's been some challenges within the family or a different way to approach this or that, or maybe their own routines have been kind of, you know, shifted a bit or what, they're different, and so they feel untethered because of that. Some people could feel it because of the nature of fast-paced society. Things are getting quicker and quicker, right? 10, 15, 20 years ago, life was complicated. Well, now it's complex, which is the next level, and it's kind of like, oh my goodness, I just, I just can't get my feet on the ground. Things are crazy and moving so much. 
Maybe it's wrestling with your own personal brokenness. All of this could contribute to the untethering that people feel. But I think in, underneath, and through all of this is something bigger. It's the prevalent rise of powerful individualism here in uh, West, Western countries, North America, Europe, particularly here in North America. So philosophy professor uh, from Montreal, Charles Taylor, has talked about this. He's written about the rise of individualism in Western countries like ours and its impacts. This is one of the things he says. The rise of individualism has wrenched us loose from all the settings that gave meaning to the lives of our forebears, meaning our ancestors. We have been thrown back on our inner resources, but when we look within ourselves, we find emptiness because we have been cut adrift from everything that once supplied the resources we are seeking. And so here's what we're going to do. We're going to look at Psalm 118. Now, Matthew, why are we looking at Psalm 118? This is Palm Sunday. Shouldn't we be looking at the Gospels when Jesus goes into Jerusalem? And we will, and we do talk about that as we talk about Psalm 118. But what I want to highlight about this text today is it's often neglected on this Sunday, but it shouldn't be because it is so interwoven into the story of Palm Sunday. Okay? So first of all, you know, now we acknowledge this on Monday, Thursday, but when Jesus and his disciples have this Passover meal, uh, the Gospel of Matthew says that afterward they sung a hymn before they leave. Now, what is that hymn? Well, this is something called the Egyptian Hallel. Hallel is a Hebrew word that means praise. Egyptian because it's Passover and they're remembering when they were rescued from slavery in Egypt. So the Egyptian Hallel was something that was sung. And it included Psalms 113 to 118. And so the last part of the meal, they would have sung, Jesus and his disciples would have sung this text that we are going through today. Not only that, but later on Palm Sunday, what we celebrate today, as he goes into Jerusalem and people are yelling, they're quoting Psalm 118. Hosanna is a quote from Psalm 118. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord is a quote from Psalm 118. What did it mean? What was the context? And we're going to unpack this a little bit with a specific goal in mind. The use of Psalm 118 teaches us something about how in our traditions to remain tethered to the things that matter most in a world that feels increasingly chaotic. It teaches us some things about what healthy tradition is like, and it keeps us tethered to the things that matter most in a world and in a time which feels, for many people, increasingly chaotic. So with that intro in mind, I invite you to open the scriptures to Psalm 118 if you have your Bibles. Um, but I'm also going to talk about the context a little bit, and so I'm going to put a few things up here as we enter into it, just to keep in mind for us, okay? And if you don't have your Bible, uh, the, the words will be on the screen in a second can open up your uh, Westminster Church app, whatever you want. Originally, we need to remember that psalms were songs. And so uh, if it feels like these are poetry or music in some sense, uh, they originally were. The melody has been lost, uh, but that's the original context. Now, what was this originally used for? Well, it's hard to be sure. Uh, scholars have speculated different things. Maybe thankfulness for some sort of personal rescue, because there's certainly a lot of thanksgiving that's going on. Someone has been in distress, and now they've been rescued. Perhaps a military victory of some sort is, is the background to this. Or maybe rededicating the temple. So as you recall, God's people, you know, in the Old Testament, at one point they are conquered by a foreign power. Many of the people of Judah have to go off and live in exile in Babylon. And uh, after 70 years, they come back. They have to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. They're, they rededicate the temple to their use. And so some people think it was used there. But the main theme, regardless of the context, is something we find uh, several times uh, in the psalm, his steadfast love endures forever. So that's the main theme. So regardless of the context, it's about this. His steadfast love endures forever. Through all the ups and downs, through all the difficulties we face, that's the theme. So everything we are about to read is to be understood in light of that reality. All right, so Psalm 118, beginning at verse 1. I'm reading from the ESV. Here we go. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. That's the theme. It comes up through the next several verses and at the very last verse as well. It's like the chorus of the song. So you know how we listen to a song on the radio and it's really catchy and you just can't get that chorus out of your head, for goodness sakes. That's like these words, his steadfast love endures forever. Some translations say love or mercy or faithful love or loyal love. In Hebrew, it's chesed. It's this covenant love of God, covenant love. We're in this covenant bond relationship with God. We pledge ourselves to him. He pledges himself to us. 
Right? This is the, the, the love of God, which is not easily thwarted or shaken. Verse 2, let Israel say his steadfast love endures forever. Let the house of Aaron say his steadfast love endures forever. Let those who fear the Lord say his steadfast love endures forever. So kind of see all these concentric circles expanding outwards. And so anyone who fears the Lord, and when we see the word fear, it's good for us to remember this isn't running for the hills fear. This is, in the words of the late uh, Billy Graham, reverential awe. People have reverential awe for the Lord. Let us acknowledge his steadfast love, which forever endures. Verse 5, out of my distress, I called on the Lord. The Lord answered me and set me free. Okay, so here's some of that rescue. I love how, by the way, this phrase, set me free, could also be translated, put me into a spacious place. Put me into a wide place. I love that. The idea that the enemy isn't close to us anymore and we don't feel the pressures of the stress and everything else. I just think that's a lovely, lovely image. Makes me feel good just thinking about it. Verse 6, the Lord is on my side. I will not fear. What can man do to me? The Lord is on my side as my helper. I shall look in triumph on those who hate me. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in man. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in princes right, or, or leaders. So the sense here is that regardless of what this person is experiencing, they probably, like most of us, have been let down by people uh, through time. And it's really hard when people who are close to you let you down. But I think the psalmist here has experienced some letdown. But despite that, God is always trustworthy. He is faithful. He is a refuge. Verse 10, all nations surround me. In the name of the Lord, I cut them off. They surrounded me, surrounded me on every side. In the name of the Lord, I cut them off. They surrounded me like bees. They went out like a fire among thorns. In the name of the Lord, I cut them off. Now, this is part of the reason why some people feel that this is actually um, in response to a military victory. Because in these verses, you get the sense that whether it's the general of an army or maybe uh, the king of the people, they've been surrounded by um, foreign oppressive nations. And so calling on God's help in the midst of battle. Verse 13, I was pushed hard so that I was falling, but the Lord helped me. The Lord is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. Glad songs of salvation are in the tents of the righteous. Tents, right? Because maybe if they're in battle, they're probably around out on the battlefield somewhere. Quote, the right hand of the Lord does valiantly. The right hand of the Lord exalts. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. Love that. Right hand, right hand, right hand. I just so appreciate this verse. It's something that I repeat uh, uh, quite often. Now, this is someone who is summoning uh, the good things of God to give them courage as they face their adversity. So when you think of the right hand of the Lord, the right hand, this is metaphorical language for specifically two traits of God, his power and his favor. The power of the Lord does valiantly. The favor of the Lord is great upon his people. Verse 17, I shall not die, but I shall live and recount the deeds of the Lord. I don't live after this great rescue just to have a comfortable, cozy life and never do anything meaningful. No, it's to recount the deeds of the Lord. It's to speak of his good things. Now, just of historical interest, by the way, this is a Protestant church and um, uh, that's, that's, that's come out of a series of churches for the Reformation in the 1500s, right? Martin Luther, who was the great Protestant reformer, one of them who had such a great influence, uh, this was actually his, his personal motto, this verse. I shall not die, but I shall live and recount the deeds of the Lord. I just think that's a cool historical point of interest. Verse 18, the Lord has disciplined me severely, but he has not given me over to death. I think that's interesting too. So great is the faith of the person who's writing this. They see their hardships and they say, wait a second, the Lord is disciplining me. Okay, this isn't necessarily all hardships, but it is some. And here he says, wait a second, I'm going through these hardships, not because God doesn't love me, but because he does love me. Like a parent disciplines a child, not because they don't like them, but because they love them and want them to be strong and great and hopeful and be able to persevere through the various challenges of life. They want them to be steadfast. Verse 19, open to me the gates of righteousness that I may enter through them and give thanks to the Lord 
Okay, gates of righteousness. This is most likely a reference to the, uh, the gates uh, of the temple in Jerusalem. This is the gate of the Lord. The righteous shall enter through it. So you got people coming through. In Hebrew, the word righteous here is plural. So you get the sense after whatever has happened, they're giving thanksgiving, they're coming to the temple, they're going through together. I thank you that you have answered me and have become my salvation. The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. Okay, so <clears throat> what's talking about? So the cornerstone in a building, and we're getting a little bit into ancient archaeology here, but... The cornerstone was very important in a structure, and we assume here that the original meaning is uh, maybe the people, maybe the temple itself, but it's made of solid stuff. And sometimes, not always, but sometimes the materials on top of the cornerstone were, were less strong than what the, what the cornerstone was made of. Not only that, but the, the direction of the walls is determined based on the location of the cornerstones. The cornerstone is very important. So is this about the fact that foreign people or foreign kings have rejected the temple uh, or the people as a whole, or the king, it's hard to be sure. But what I want to draw our attention here too is that in Matthew 21, 42, Jesus calls himself the cornerstone. So he says that he is the, he is the cornerstone. We are built upon him. And the religious leadership has rejected him. So Jesus actually takes this and applies this to himself. Verse 23, this is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. And then verse 24, this is the day, this is the day, you know, that the Lord has made, that the Lord has made. That's where this comes from, verse 24. Oh yeah, we will rejoice and be glad. Oh yeah, look at you guys, singing people, I love it. This is the day the Lord has made, let us rejoice and be glad in it. So that's where this comes from, verse 24. And so what was that? The day of victory from military problems, whatever it happened to be, yeah, most likely, but really we can apply this to any day, can't we? Right? We wake up in the morning and maybe our back isn't hurting like it was when we went to bed. This is the day the Lord has made. Maybe we go outside to walk the dog and, you know, an intake of wonderful fresh air and that's so amazing and we love it or we see one of those gorgeous sunrises, right? It's just so incredible. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Verse 25, save us, we pray, O Lord. O Lord, we pray, give us success. Now here, the people are calling on God for his saving help in their lives. And this is where that word in Hebrew comes into Greek, comes into English. And so as Jesus goes into Jerusalem, going through the gates and the righteous coming around him, it is most likely this psalm that is in their mind when they call it Hosanna. It's most likely a quote from Psalm 118, especially since as the pilgrims are in Jerusalem for the Passover, they've been singing the Egyptian Hallel. They've been singing this. They're going to worship. They're praying. They're talking. This is so on their minds that they start calling out. They, they interpret the meaning of what's going on around them based on the scriptures. I think that's so important. What goes on in Scripture, since God is consistent in His character then, He is consistent in His character now. Oh, this is surely what the Lord is doing through this person, Jesus. And I think that that's, a, I think that's right, because the very next verse is an overt quote from, from the psalm that they all use. Blessed is He who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. Was that originally about the priest giving the sacrifice, the king leading the... The warriors back from battle, it's hard to be sure, but how appropriate because Jesus is the king. He is the king of kings. And now they acknowledge his kingship and they celebrate him as he goes into Jerusalem. The Lord is God. He has made his light to shine upon us. Bind the festal sacrifice with cords up to the horns of the altar. And so they're bringing this sacrifice into the altar. What are horns on the altar? It just means raised corners. So that was common type of altar. You are my God, and I will give thanks to you. You are my God. I will extol you, celebrate you, lift high your name. Verse 29, so it ends with the exact same words with which it began. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Let's say that last line, verse 29, together. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. All right, so the use of Psalm 118 teaches us something about how in our traditions to remain tethered to the things that matter most in a world that feels increasingly chaotic. And so we're using this as an example of healthy tradition. And Psalm 118 reminds us how 
to remain tethered to what matters most in a world that is increasingly chaotic. So just as this, as an example of looking to the scriptures and understanding what we are going through now based on what had happened in the past, it's a great example for that. So we're going to highlight some of the things that are going on that those ancient pilgrims would have known, would have seen, would have done, and apply it to our own situation and our own understanding of what healthy traditions are. Okay, so how does Psalm 118 do this? Let me highlight a few things. First, it reminds us to fix our eyes on God no matter what. That's the point of that chorus. His steadfast love endures forever. It reminds us to pray, verse 5, out of my distress I called to the Lord. Verse 14 and 15, it reminds us to sing, the Lord is my strength and my song. It reminds us to pass on knowledge of God's goodness. Verse 17, I shall live and recount the deeds of the Lord. I'm not keeping it to myself. I'm engaging in customs and events which enable me, us, to pass this on. Next, it reminds us to gather. Verse 19, this is the gate of the Lord. The righteous, plural, shall enter through it. And also, it reminds us to fix our eyes on Jesus. The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. Verse 22. So healthy tradition tethers us through teaching, through customs and events, which facilitate these types of things. See, because by ourselves, especially in an age which feels so untethered and craziness and chaotic and everything's happening around us, by ourselves, we just sort of spin in the wind of these chaos, of this chaos. And so a healthy tradition, what it does, rooted in Scripture, is like, okay, it's going to, through teaching, events, customs, facilitate those types of things. And we need them. Okay? <laughs> That's what healthy tradition does. Unhealthy traditionalism is about going through the motions and ticking a box and remaining like a dead leaf swirling around in the winds of chaos. It also reminds us to rejoice. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Verse 24. You see, sometimes in our life we get down and we're discouraged or we're despairing, whatever it happens to be. But if we're engaging in healthy tradition, what that's, it comes around us and supports us and, and gives us opportunities to rejoice. All right, this is what reality is like. That's who God is. It also reminds us to call on Him for help. Save us, we pray, O Lord. O Lord, we pray, give us success. Verse 25. It also reminds us to worship, bind the festal sacrifice with cords up to the horns of the altar. Now, we might worship in a bit of a different way. However, the idea is that we do worship. And so these sorts of things are occurring, rejoicing, calling out to God for help and worship. And so healthy tradition through teaching, customs and events facilitates those sorts of things in our lives. Unhealthy traditionalism is just about going through the motions and ticking a box and remaining like a dead leaf circling around in the winds of chaos. Lastly, it reminds us, Psalm 118, to be thankful no matter what. Verse 1, verse 19, Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for He is good. His stead, sorry, 29. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for He is good, for His steadfast love endures forever. We need that. We need that. We need opportunities to recognize the goodness of God and to be thankful for Him. Because what happens is our minds get sucked into this dark place where we're not thankful as we should. We don't see the things of God. We all see the chaos on the news or everything else in our social media feeds. And so healthy tradition, through teaching, customs, and events, facilitates opportunities for thanksgiving that we might otherwise take with God's people. But unhealthy traditionalism... So we're going through the motions and ticking a box and remaining like a dead leaf circulating in the winds of chaos. It's not good. And all of these things that are here listed as a part of healthy tradition, fixing our eyes on God no matter what, praying, singing, passing on knowledge of God's goodness, gathering, fixing our eyes on Jesus, rejoicing, calling out to God for help, worship, and being thankful no matter what are part of what this psalm teaches us, and that's a bedrock and a template for what a healthy tradition is like. And so I really want us to reflect on these two words uh, as we um, ponder this weekend, as we start Holy Week. Do we celebrate traditions or are we succumbing to dead traditionalism? This is something we can talk about, maybe in yourself, in your household, or just ponder it yourself as you're on for a walk, whatever it happens to be. Because tradition gives traction in the right direction. When so many people feel untethered and the world is chaotic, tradition gives traction in the right direction. Dead traditionalism doesn't help you. And one of the ways that we can think about this is focusing on not just on what we're doing, but why we're doing it. 
And I think that's so important because when we have these things like Palm Sunday or Monday, Thursday or Good Friday or even Easter, it's something we do and many of us have done since before we can remember. What happens is that we just do it and we don't talk about why we're doing it and how this is so central to the Christian faith. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 15, 17, if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. The resurrection isn't real. Go home. Nothing's real. It's all based upon the reality of the risen Jesus. And this is what has value in our lives. We need to remind ourselves about what has value, what is good, what is true, what is pure, what sustains us. And this has value, the biblical teachings, which we remind ourselves time and time again with these wonderful traditions. Harold Kushner tells about a story, a Hasidic story. This man back in the days of telegrams um, got a telegram saying uh, a family member had died and he had an inheritance. Wow, okay, that's pretty cool. That's good news to get. That's a good telegram to receive. And so how do I, you know, how do I respond to this? And so, okay, you just have to go talk to this certain rabbi and he'll, you know, he'll tell you what to do. And so he goes and talks to the rabbi and the rabbi said, your dead relative is Moses and your inheritance is the religious teachings of Scripture. And much of the time, Kushner, Kushner explains, people react kind of in the same way that the man reacted in this story, disappointed that their legacy was religious wisdom and not downtown real estate. But what are the things that matter? And how do we organize our lives around the things that matter or don't? Because let me tell you, my friends, one day we will all die and on our deathbed, we will look back on our lives. What are the things that matter most? God matters. The teachings of Scripture matter. The, the, the wisdom and the things we have learned, not only to be the hands and feet of Christ, to experience that goodness ourselves, but, but to be a blessing to other people. That's what matters. And traditions tether us to this in a world that feels increasingly chaotic. And so the reason I share this today is because not only are we at the start of Holy Week, but I do think that so many people are increasingly untethered Lack of clarity, lack of stability, lack of structure in their lives, maybe because of the pandemic, maybe because of fast-paced society, maybe because of stuff they're wrestling with in their own lives. But in and through it all is the prevailing individualism which pulls people from their roots and casts them adrift into the wind. It will not be so for us. Farms in the American Midwest have horrible windstorms. That's a final thought. And uh, these horrible windstorms, so, so windy and so chaotic and crazy are these storms that you hear of these farmers who would tie a rope from their house to the barn because the winds would be so horrific and threatening that if they're in the house and something happened with the animals and they needed to check them, they needed a rope to hold on to in the winds or else they actually would, they, they could get literally swept away. Or if they were in the barn when the windstorm came up and they needed to get back to the house, they'd be able to get back there. And as I was thinking about this, I thought, oh, I'm, that reminds me actually of a scene from a movie that I saw, um, you know, The Wizard of Oz with Dorothy. And at, right at the start, you know, before she gets plunked into a magical land named Oz. So this isn't about that. This is about those winds that were so strong right at the start. And I looked it up. Kansas is in the American Midwest, uh, technically speaking. So that was probably in people's experiences and minds as they're thinking about creating the story. But the rope between the barn and the house was to help them find their way and not get swept away. And the healthy traditions that we have rooted in Scripture are like that rope between the barn and the house that we might find our way and not get swept away. And so what do you celebrate, tradition or traditionalism? Tradition gives traction in the right direction. Tradition is the living faith of the dead. Traditionalism is the dead faith of the living. And so as we celebrate and we engage in this most holy and most special of weeks, uh, our prayer for one another, I think, could be verse 25, Hosanna, save us, God. O oh Lord, we pray, give us success. Thanks be to the God who does all things in and through Christ for his glory. Amen.